Dear Lord in heaven, thank you for this day that we've been blessed to receive. Thank you for the beautiful warm sunshine we have here in Victoria. Thank you for the messages that we're receiving, the rain that is falling upon us, your Holy Spirit, which we see upon these boards, these lines, this understanding of gender equality, of radical feminism. We ask that we will please in, in faith and in practice exemplify this standard, the standard of heaven, that we may be fit vessels to do a work and service for you, whatever you ask of us, that we may within our spheres of influence show people what the kingdom of heaven is like. We pray for a blessing upon all our members and ask that you'll please be, be with uh, all those who are hurting, who are, who are enduring the most horrendous circumstances. God bless us, all we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So today I am continuing on with a study that uh, was started last time I was presenting about a month ago. And it was a study that Elder Tess did in, in France back in October of 2021. And it was looking at uh, a feminism, a radical feminism. It looks at uh, multiple topics and sifting information sources on the left hand side. Uh, so I'll do a quick review of what we looked at last time I presented and, and then we'll continue on with her presentations that she's, she's done. Uh, I have my chat open. So if there's any questions, please feel free to ask. And I'll have some share screens and uh, questions to ask of you as well. So first I'll share screen and we will have a look at Are you able to see that screen there? Is that in full screen for you? Yes. And which one are you seeing? You're seeing the definition of feminism there? Uh, yes, and the definition of sexism. Great, thank you. Just wanted to make sure I had that working properly. So there are, uh, it, it's not easy to give a definition of feminism. We understand, as we learned at the end of last study, that our words are impactful and have meaning. And this definition, the few words that we have on this page, does not fully encapsulate all that feminism is or all that sexism is, but it tries to give a broad understanding, a simple outline, as we understand, of these, these issues. So a definition of feminism is a belief in and an advocacy of the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes expressed, especially through organized activity on behalf of women's rights and interests. And you can see the source there. A definition of sexism uh, is the name used to explain how social inequalities between men and women are reinforced or upheld through norms, through values and attitudes. And we can sum this up or in the word culture. So norms, values, and attitudes are culture. We understand also that when we're looking at the way the, the, the world is currently structured, it's based on a patriarchal system where many of the systems that we have in society are there to put forward men first. Women, people of colour, a whole range of people are left behind or not even considered. And so what we under want to understand is that radical feminism is a particular type of feminism that wants to undo those structures to recreate them in a way where there can be gender equality. So I'm just gonna stop sharing for a moment there.
on the board here behind us, uh, this is part of what we looked at the last time. We're looking at three waves of feminism uh, and particularly some key points up to our present history. The first wave of feminism begins in 1848 and it refers to, the first wave refers to the first <clears throat> Western sustained political movement dedicated to achieving political equality uh, for women. And we know these to be the suffragettes of the late 19th and the early 20th century. So this started at Seneca Falls Convention. This was a convention where there was about 200 women that come together. They met in a church in New York, which is where Seneca Falls is, uh, to discuss the social, civil and religious condition of river, women's rights. Uh, attendees discussed their grievances and passed a list of 12 resolutions calling for specific equal rights including after much debate, the right to vote. And that's what we eventually saw in 1919 and 1920 was uh, an opportunity for women to vote. We come along to the second wave feminism, which begins in 1963. And this is looking at a book that was written there, The Feminine Mystique, and the impact that this had on America at the time. The idea of feminism and what it, under, what it entails was known previously. But what the feminine mystique was able to do was to get into the household of millions of people. It was a revolutionary reach that it had throughout America. It made its way into the hands of housewives who gave it to their friends, who passed it along through a whole chain of well-educated middle-class white women with beautiful homes and families. And it gave them permission to be angry. I'm reading a quote here. And once those 3 million readers realized that they were angry, feminism once again had cultural momentum behind it. It had a unifying goal, not just political equality, which the first waivers had fought for, but also social equality. So what we notice back here is we see a political equality coming in, particularly with the right to vote. And then we see a, quite a, a lull for a period of time within feminism. And then a book is written, The Feminine Mystique, and this goes out to a lot of people and it stirs up, uh, quite rightly, anger as one of, the, one of the emotions to, to continue to build and grow upon the great work that had already been done. So from 1963 to 1989, we have second wave feminism. By the end of second wave feminism uh, and all through the beginning of the third wave to our current point, we see that feminism has become separated and, and splintered. There are many different voices within, within feminism, uh, many different ideas. And unfortunately, during the end of this period here, the end of second wave feminism, people start using the idea that we need to have more attractive people within feminism so that they will be taken seriously, so that more people will follow them, uh, so that they can become more popular and, and have a wider reach. And the reason why they started to use that is because during first wave feminism and here during second wave feminism, there is a two prong attack upon people within feminism, anyone who disagrees with culture. 
and it is attack based on your appearance and it's also attack based on your personality and they're very effective and we'll look, look at that a little bit later why they're so effective So that compromise to retain the, the standard of beauty that set by men uh, suggests that female doesn't look good without makeup or without correct hairstyle or clothing or whatever it might be, uh, has destroyed what true feminism stands for. We also understand it's the same attack that was used by Lucifer in heaven against Christ, uh, that apis bull mindset. I'll, I'll share screen with you. So we're reading from the story of redemption 13.1 and it's a familiar story elder Tess has, has covered this comprehensively we're just going over a review and it's something that i think came up in vespers this week lucifer in heaven before his rebellion was a high and exalted angel next to next in honor to god's dear son his countenance like those of the other angels was mild and expressive of happiness his forehead was high and broad, showing a powerful intellect. His form was perfect, his bearing noble and majestic. A special light beamed in his countenance and shone around him brighter and more beautiful than around the other angels. Yet Christ, God's dear son, had the preeminence over all the angelic host. So just scrolling down a little bit further within that quote. I can't seem to do. So the next next paragraph down, fourteen point one says. Were not his garments light and beautiful, why should Christ thus be honoured before him? So what we notice here in heaven before the fall, Lucifer has been focusing on beauty and notices his beauty and puts that as a standard of measurement as to uh, somehow ability or, or a, a, a measuring stick. Uh, in the kingdom of heaven. So what we see here is this, this culture war, this difference, there's two streams of information. We see this culture here that is, is putting looks at the very beginning in heaven uh, as, uh, as a measuring stick. And we see that perpetuated throughout the entire history of earth. So we understand from the very beginning that's that's the way it has been. This is this apis bull mentality. And uh, particularly men have perpetuated this. And culture has continued this throughout all of our history. So as we travel down through history in 1968, there was a Miss America contest. And at this Miss America contest, there was a, uh, there was a, an uprising, a, a demonstration that was to, by feminists that was trying to um, highlight the the issues and the problems with having these beauty pageants and the the social inequality and the injustices of what takes place and 
we'll come to that very shortly. What we want to do now is go down a little bit further in history to 1989. In 1989, we see two major things happen throughout the second wave, at the end of the second wave. We see an understanding of intersectionality and we see a legal battle take place between Pricewaterhouse and uh, Hopkins. And we'll just have a quick look at that. I'll share screen again and refresh our memories as to what that was. So Price Waterhouse Coopers, the employee Ann Hopkins sued her former employer, the accounting firm Price Waterhouse. She argued that the firm denied her partnership because she did not fit the partner's idea of what a female employee should look and act like. The employer failed to prove that it would have denied her partnership anyway, and the court held that constituted sex discrimination under. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The significance of the Supreme Court's ruling was twofold. First, it established that gender stereotyping is actionable as sex discrimination. And second, it is established that it established a mixed motive framework that enables employees to prove discrimination when other lawful reasons for the adverse employment action exists alongside discriminatory motivations or reasons. So particularly their gender stereotyping is sex discrimination. So Anne was a lawyer there at, at, the, at that firm and uh, she wasn't allowed to, allowed to make the title of partner. She wasn't allowed, able to be promoted. Um, she was by far the best worker and she chose not to dress in a way that society and culture defined that women should dress or to act or to speak. And so as a result of that, the people at the workplace, Pricewaterhouse, didn't promote her. And when she took it to court, she won. So that was Price Water House Coopers. And the other is the other understanding that comes to light in 1989 is intersectionality. Intersectionality is a, uh, a big word, hard to understand for me, uh, but it is made easier when we have a diagram. So I'll share screen with you of an intersectionality diagram of gender. So what intersectionality is, it refers to the way in which different aspects of a person's identity can expose them to overlapping forms of discrimination and marginalization. So through the, the the middle here in the green, we've got gender. And the testing message for our time at the moment is gender equality. We're looking at how uh, women are overwhelmingly in the, uh, can't think of the word at the moment, are discriminated against, uh, abused by society are told how to act, behave, think, what they should wear, all those things. And what we see here in the different tabs is that just in a small way, in a small diagram, Venn diagram, to try and help us to understand how this impacts women in particular, but as a side, society as a whole, based on their religion, their age, whether they have a disability or not, their geography, their culture, their income, um, whether they're of the LGBT community, um, their education, the race and ethnicity, all these impact 
females in a particular way and it is very different from the circumstances that each woman would find throughout the globe and even throughout the country within the same country you would see two people two females would experience discrimination and marginalization in very different ways uh, all all must be done away with and this is what we see in the center here these overlapping forms of discrimination and marginalization that he experienced in different ways. So this is a relatively new term that's come to be understood from 1989 and is growing in understanding to our present day. And a lot of good studies have been done on how, from radical feminism point of view, how this impacts the world, how this impacts females in particular, but also the the detrimental effect it has on the world. So that brings us to the end of second wave feminism and the beginning of third wave feminism, where we we saw Anita Hill and the events surrounding Anita Hill. So I'll share screen with you again and So here are two quotes talking about what took place with Anita Hill. In 1991, President George Bush nominated Clarence Thomas, a federal circuit judge, to succeed retiring associate Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Senate hearings on his confirmation were initially completed with Thomas's good character being presented as a primary qualification for the High Court because he had only been a judge for slightly more than one year. So because he'd only been judged for a short period of time, they relied on supposedly his good character. There had been little organized opposition to Thomas. So no one really put up great evidence towards him not being nominated until the interview with uh, of Hill, Anita Hill by the FBI was leaked to the press. So the hearings were then reopened and Anita Hill was called to publicly testify. Hill said, Anita Hill said on October 11, 1991 in televised hearings that Thomas had sexually harassed her while he was her supervisor at the Department of Education and the EEOC. When questioned on why she followed Thomas to the second job after he had already allegedly harassed her, she said working in a reputable position within the civil rights field had been her ambition. The position was appealing enough to inhibit her from going back to the private practice with her previous firm. She said that she only realized later in her life that the choice had represented poor judgment on her part and that at that time, it appeared that the sexual overtures had ended. So a few points to, to grab here is that Anita Hill is the victim and what the questioning is doing by this committee is making her look guilty. She hasn't done anything wrong. Nothing she did was wrong. Going there and working there was her, was her dream. That's what she wanted in a progression of her job. And we wouldn't say that of any uh, man that went for that job. You would say that that man has a right to be there and to feel safe and secure and, and happy in their choice of work. The same must be said for Anita Hill. But because of sexism, we turn Anita uh, from being a victim into making her look like a guilty party, but she is only a victim. Shortly after Thomas, uh, Thomas's confirmation hearings, President Bush dropped his opposition to a bill that gave harassment victims the right to seek federal damage awards, back pay and reinstatement. And the law was passed by Congress. So 
George Bush was opposing a bill, a, a piece of legislation that would give harassment victims the right to seek compensation. So he stopped opposing that and allowed it to go through. As a result, one year later, harassment complaints filed with the EEOC were up 50% and public opinion had shifted in Anita Hill's favour. Private companies also started training programs to deter sexual harassment. Uh, and when journalist uh, Cindy Kennard asked Hill in 1991 if she would testify against Thomas all over again, Hill answered, I'm not sure if I could have lived with myself if I had answered those questions any differently. The manner in which the Senate Judiciary Committee challenged and dismissed Anita Hill's accusations of sexual harassment angered female politicians and lawyers. According to DC Congressional Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton, Hill's treatment by the panel was a contributing factor to the large number of women elected to Congress in 1992. Women clearly went to the polls with the notion in mind that you had to have more women in Congress, she said. So these were the events that took place in, we're focusing on in particular, 1989 and 1991. And why that's important is because the seed of the issue that we see taking place during this time, an understanding of intersectionality, uh, seeing this, this battle taking place in court and then seeing Anita Hill and what's taking place is a seed that continues to grow throughout the rest of our reform line. It helps us to understand, it helps us to see that gender equality is the testing issue. Radical feminism and its understanding of how to grapple these issues is what we are to know and understand because this is the character of God. So we can see on the reform line, this is a reform line of 144,000. And we have grown in understanding from the beginning, the time of the end, we see an increase in knowledge. And we know that in each dispensation, we receive an increase in knowledge and a formalization. We see that taking place here as well, between 2001 and the Sunday law. We know it as the, the hand of God, the five way marks with the four dispensations in between. We had a, an increase in knowledge in 2019 and we begin to understand in very childlike terms gender and gender equality. From the increase in knowledge all the way through to the formalisation in 2021, we see the subjects of the APIS bull. We see the subjects of false freedom and then and LGBT. Uh, understanding and the growth that we've had in our understandings of these subjects as we approach the Sunday law and the tests involved. In 2018 and 2019, through the Midnight Cry, we learned of two streams of information and understood that one stream needed to be entirely discarded. If this is a diagram of two streams of information and on the left these can be also considered as uh, republican and democratic ideology that we completely discard the information that is on the right 
But what we've understood and grown, uh, grown to learn is that the information on the left must be sifted carefully. We understood this from, at least from the beginning of this, this study that Elder Tess presented in, in France of 2021, that there is a lot of error within the left stream. That we see so much compromise that has caused trouble, particularly with focusing on feminism, we understand the difference, we are understanding and, and growing an understanding of the differences between radical feminism and liberal feminism or mainstream feminism. And those differences are, are glaring and obvious and uh, must be addressed because the issues that arise within us, within our words, within our actions are the cause of uh, caused by the culture and learning and understanding that we've received need to be undone. So it doesn't matter what author we see here in this, this left side of information, this left stream of information, doesn't matter how good they are, we must trace and understand carefully what has been written because the people here on this, in this stream of information, the left stream, are just like you and I. They have grown up experiencing the experiences of what this culture, what their culture has to offer. They've grown up with the same biases, with preferences and beliefs, and these inevitably mould what they write and how they view events in history and in current day. So each of the writers are affected just like you and I with culture. And some of them have done a great work of undoing the culture and have been very blessed or privileged to live in a household that would have helped promote and nurture their, their understanding. So we understand that two streams of information but the left also must be sifted. We can't just accept everything that's here. And that's been known for quite a while and taught. Gender equality is not a test just for the people of this movement. Gender equality is a test for the world. We've seen this taking place throughout this history, throughout this history, all the way through third wave feminism, right to the close of probation. There has been an abundance of information given by uh, good articles written, people who understand the effects of patriarchy, the effects of culture on the people, on the community, and how this must be undone. So we know in the beginning of modern Israel, the test was race. If we draw up a line here, modern Israel, time of the end, seventeen ninety eight. This is a alpha history. They had a test of race in this history. And we know with modern Israel, we have an Amiga history as well. In that Amiga history, our test is gender. We're going to put the time of the end, 1989.
The same is also said of the counterfeit. As Taylor presented today, the counterfeit and the issues there, they are confronted, they were confronted with race issues. And we understand from World War II, the persecution of the Jews. And the side that they took during that, that persecution. We also understand at the end of the world, here, now, today, that The counterfeit is also facing the issues of gender. So what we're seeing here is America, this movement, the counterfeit uh, have each had to deal with race in the past and the current testing message is gender. So the people, everyday people who are, who you see outside, outside of this movement, all of them are having to deal with the issues of gender and the way they are able to get onto the correct stream of information has been published for them to be able to see. There's plenty of information there. One of the ways dealing with this period here, Clarence Thomas in 1991, one of the ways Clarence Thomas was defended during his trial before his selection to Supreme Court judge was to highlight the fact that he was African-American. It was a, it was determined that the attack on him was a racist attack, politically motivated racist attack. Even though Anita Hill herself was a person of colour, it was still considered a politically motivated racist attack. That a logical way of thinking is still present with us. Uh, most sources of information through the correct stream here, I've rubbed it out, but through, through the left stream, left ideological leaning understanding focuses its attention on race instead of gender. They get hooked up in something that has was a past testing message and should be overcome. We know that it's not, but our test today is gender. And we understand that the newspapers that we need to sift so carefully get it wrong and often too often focus on race instead of gender. So we talked about uh, very briefly before that there are two main attacks used against women who, who call for change. Throughout each of these three waves of feminism that we've seen, the attack is always the same. It's a physical appearance and it's a personality don't you have a sense of humour? So a person will attack the phys physical appearance of a woman. And then if you don't laugh at that, then they attack your personality. They'll say to you, don't you have a sense of humour? What's wrong with you? Why is that, why is that attack so effective and offensive? Does anyone know why? concentrating on these two points is so detrimental to people, particularly women. Throughout 
all of our growth and understanding that we've received from childhood to our present state, we have been taught in a culture and a society that teaches sexism, that teaches women that they are to dress and act in a particular way. Uh, as someone has, has said, stereotyping. Women have been stereotyped to, to look a certain way, to act a certain way, to speak in the right tones and with a voice that's not too high and not too low, all the rubbish that was, has been taught and has been pushed and, and promulgated through, through beauty pageants and all the exposure that we see on TV. We can't go through all of the different ways where we, we see this. It is, it is everywhere. We know it's culture, it's through our churches, it's through Adventist churches. And everything is based on that first attack that we saw in heaven when Lucifer used his appearance as the reason why Lucifer should be first. And we see that same mindset taken down through, through history. So the physical appearance is everything. A culture teaches that it is everything. It teaches women that you're not actually a woman unless you look this way. It teaches them how to dress, how to behave, what to wear. And the, the damage that that causing is only just the tip of the iceberg is, is starting to be comprehended and understood. Radical feminism doesn't laugh at the jokes that, that sexist, uh, the sexist jokes that we hear throughout society. It doesn't have a sense of humor because that sense of humor is degrading a person. It is enslaving a person, beating them down. It is abuse and it does not stand for abuse. It sees the underlying horror of the practice and understands the science as well as the data. And don't just see people or women as statistics. So radical feminism calls for a radical reordering of society in which a male supremacy is eliminated uh, in all social and economic contexts, while recognizing that a woman's experience uh, are also affected by other social divisions, such as race and class and sexual orientation. Liberal feminism wants to, or main, mainstream feminism is that branch that wants to focus on achieving its version of gender equality through political and legal reforms, but without changing the framework of a liberal democracy. Don't wanna make big changes, uh, just use the laws that are already in place and make it that whatever changes can be made through them. It doesn't understand how the structure of society works and it wants to integrate women into the current structure uh, and, and supposedly get gender equality there. But we understand when we look back at race and the things that took place, especially with imprisonment, um, there's been, I, I think, uh, Someone's done a study on African-Americans within America who, who go to prison and the, the chances that they have of a life after that are so slim. They're put into this perpetual cycle of going back to prison. They can never vote. Their rights are stripped from them. We understand that that structure that's in place there which was set up um, back through this history here, means that they can never rise above that unless that structure is taken away. That is the same for 
gender. The structures that are in place, which we are starting to learn and understand, are so detrimental to women, which is most impacted, and then to society as a whole, uh, we, we can't even fathom the damage that that's causing. So what I want to do is share screen with you again and go through a particular um, couple of paragraphs written by the Washington Post and, and other authors that show some of the critiques against people, particularly women who have stood up against sexism and against the prevailing culture. So I'll share screen with you now. So this is an article from the Washington Post. This is talking about 1968 and the beauty pageant that was taking place and Uh, we'll, we'll just have a quick read. In Atlantic City, women threw, uh, but contrary to law, did not incinerate bras. So one of the one of the accusations or derogatory terms used against people, particularly females, who stood for feminist ideas and understandings, they called them bra burners, and it come from this particular. Um, protest where they would uh, throw their bra, but they didn't burn them. Officials prohibited having a fire on the boardwalk. Also, girdles, makeup, high heels, girly mags, all deemed instruments of female torture. They were tossed into the freedom trash can. So they had these, this group of items here that they've thrown into this trash can that's got freedom written on it and understanding that these different uh, cultural expectations were harming and torturing females. The protest has passed out leaflets, mimographed literature uh, was a hallmark of the movement, while large crowd gathered, some taunted the protesters, though Morgan recalls how friendly the bystanders were. But the myth of bra burning stuck. Critics jumped all over the idea, labeling women hairy legged and humorless. But the participants had a ball. It felt very joyous. So the people of the, the feminist movement, they had fun doing what they were doing. Um, but they were labeled hairy legged. So they were labeled ugly because they were feminists and now uh, labeled as humorless. The two attacks that we see by society against others who, particularly women who don't fit in. So this was uh, an article written about the 1968 protest. I'll stop sharing and we'll scroll down a little bit further. This first quote from Deborah Road is going to also speak of this same time period. Deborah Road wrote an appearance as a feminist issue. This was in January uh, 2016, she wrote this, and she is from Stanford Law School, a lawyer there. In the 1960s, the emergence of second wave of feminism brought a more fundamental and sustained challenge to the beauty industry. In 1968, protesters at the Miss America pageant announced a boycott of all products related to the competition and unceremoniously deposited bras, girdles, curlers, false eyelashes, and women's magazines into a freedom trash can. Although no undergarments were burned, the label bra burner stuck as an all purpose uh, 
pejorative to characterize radical feminists. Among the group, the authors of, statement, of a statement accompanying the protest, which explained women in our society are forced daily to compete for male approval, enslaved by ludicrous beauty standards that we ourselves are conditioned to take seriously. So we see a particular attack take place in second wave feminism uh, against looks, but it's been that way from the beginning and it continues all through our history. But we see in second wave feminism that there's a, a unifi unified response by radical feminism to stand up and counter those beauty standard, supposedly standard industries practices. Uh, reading down to the next paragraph, these are in all in order. So I've taken different paragraphs, all from this, this same document, just so you know, they're not in order. Our preoccupation with appearance also carries health risks, including eating disorders, yo-yo dieting, that's just unhealthy dieting, you, you put back on the weight as soon as you, you stop, and cosmetic surgery. From a health perspective, the current obsession with thinness is misdirected. It compromises the reproductive and work capacity and predicts higher rates of sickness. Except at extreme levels, weight is less important than fitness in preventing disease and prolong, prolonging life. Concerns about appearances are also linked to depression, anxiety, and low self-esteem. Even fashion footwear carries a cost. High heels are a major contributor to serious back and foot problems. I wouldn't expect that there is anything new that is uh, found in this paragraph that we wouldn't already understand. But what we haven't completely understood is how that impacts society as a whole and particularly how it impacts women. When we take away the appearance, which we've said is for a long time, is, is the standard set by society that if you don't meet these, then you're there's something wrong with you. And when we take away their personality by attacking their sense of humor. We say, you don't have a sense of humor, so your personality mustn't be any good. We have left them with no place to go. We have left them in utter dismay. And the, the self-esteem issues that arise out of this, it's, it's so hard to get rid of. It's almost impossible, almost impossible. But God has made a way through these messages that we're receiving. And also the Nethanims are obviously receiving because they're receiving an understanding of that correct stream of information. They're not hearing it directly from us and God has got a way for them to be able to hear it. And that is through that correct stream of information that shares articles like this to help people understand the dangers and the issues with sexism. Heading down to the next paragraph. Another cost of our cultural preoccupation with appearance is discrimination. Appearance skews judgments about competence. Resumes and essays get less favorable evaluations when they are thought to belong to less attractive individuals. Overweight individuals are seen to have less effective work habits and ability to get along with others. Less attractive teachers get less favorable course evaluations from students and less attractive students receive lower ratings in their intelligence from teachers. So based on your appearance, we can see how culture works. The better looking you are, the smarter you are. You get better grades and we know this is no, no different. We understand this. If you compare and contrast that with race, we understood and understand if you've seen any of the local information in America, black coaches of the NFL are passed by. 
white, white coaches are the ones given the jobs. The same is said of gender. Appearance of the woman and even just being a woman excludes them from being in a job. They get less favorable results. Um, in this particular study, she's talking about um, students getting less, less favorable marks. Um, we understand it's not just male, female, but we're, we're focusing on the gender equality aspect of this and was why we're focusing on, on female, why it is a testing message. I'm just going to stop sharing there for a moment just so I can scroll down a little bit more. A meta-analysis, sorry, I'll wait for that to load on your screens. <clears throat> a meta-analysis, the aggregated findings of over a hundred studies found that although less attractive indi individuals are perceived as less competent, the actual correlation between physical appearance and intellect intellectual competence is virtually zero. So there's lots of good studies in the correct stream of information that tell you appearance has nothing to do with your ability. Even your physical build being, maybe you have more weight than other people, has nothing to do with it. In the previous uh, paragraphs we read that weight has less to do with um, your health than fitness. You can be of a larger size, but your fitness is what determines their health. Um, there's, there's been a, a quite unhealthy um, sense of, of direction within the fitness community that your weight is somehow what makes you healthy. And we categorize that as BMI or your body mass index. And if you're over a, a certain percentage of fat, then, then there's issues. But science has, has shown that the fitness of that person is of a greater value than the thinness. Although the relative importance of appearance varies by occupation, Less attractive individuals are generally less likely to be hired and promoted and earn lower salaries. Penalties are apparent even in professions like lawyer and college professors, where appearance bears no demonstrable relationship to job performance. About 60% of overweight women report experiences of employment discrimination such discrimination on the basis of appearance carries both individual and social costs. It undermines self-esteem and diminishes job aspirations and compromises efficiency and equity. The overemphasis of attractiveness diminishes women's credibility and diverts attention from their capabilities and accomplishments. In the long run, these are more stable sources of self-esteem and social power than appearance, talking about capabilities and accomplishments. The devaluation and sexualization of women based on appearance is particularly apparent for women in leadership positions. We understand if you just take a look at politically what happened with the women who were present through Donald Trump's uh, presidency. Um, each of them were attacked for what they wore, how they looked. Anyone who is a female who is in a lead role or who is a, how did I put this here? In a leadership position is always going to suffer worse as a result because of patriarchy, because of 
uh, society's cultural biases. Discrimination on the basis of appearance also compounds gender inequality by reinforcing a double standard and a double bind for women. They face greater pressures than men to be attractive and greater penalties for falling short. As a consequence, their self-worth is more dependent upon looks. Overweight women are judged more harshly than overweight men and are more susceptible to eating disorders and related psychological and physical dysfunctions. About 90% of cosmetic surgery patients are female. With all the financial costs and the physical risks that such procedures pose, yet even as the culture expects women to conform, they often face ridicule for their efforts. It doesn't matter the time and energy and effort that you put into it. Someone's still going to comment in a negative way or mock a botched surgery or whatever it might be. They are the most uh, vile and, and unhelpful ways to, to bring down people and particularly women, as we saw with 90% of people who are having cosmetic surgery being women. And we understand why, because women are set that standard of beauty, which has been there from the beginning. In one study of makeup in the workplace, virtually all participants believed that they had a choice about whether to use cosmetics. But many also believed that women who declined to wear makeup do not appear to be one, healthy, two, heterosexual, heterosexual, or three, credible. So too, even women who are satisfied with their decision to have cosmetic surgery are often highly critical of the culture that had led them to take that step. Such surgery is a symptom of an unjust social order in which women have to go to extremes just to look acceptable. So why were we reading that out? Throughout the attacks based against females who stood for gender equality, who were feminine, feminists, we, we see that, that two-pronged attack. And that two-pronged attack is your physical appearance and then attacking your personality if you don't laugh at what is spoken of or joked of. This attack has been successfully advanced all through this, this period. And if you have a look at anything on, on social media of any of the cases, particularly Amber Heard and, and John Depp, that you will see that those same attacks being used time, in, time and time again. It is, one particular aspect that we're looking of throughout this study is uh, the de detrimental effect that it has against women and how society continues to advance this cause. If there are no more questions, we will close in prayer and I will hand back to Elder Terry. If you please kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. Dear Lord in heaven, thank you for this day that we've been blessed to receive for the beautiful weather. Thank you that we are slowly understanding sexism and the, the damage that is done over thousands of years. We ask that you will please bless us and guide us with the rain that we are receiving to understand and comprehend your character, to assimilate this in, in faith and practice, that we may be fit vessels, able and willing to do a work, whatever is set before us. We ask that we 
will throw everything on the altar and leave nothing behind to get rid of all the culture that we have imbibed and learned and unlearned for the health and well-being of everyone. And may our sphere of influence recognize and understand the qualities that radical feminism is here to bring, that the character of God is here to show us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.